Thank you for your very warm welcome. Good evening, everybody. So, uh, just by way of in introduction, I am a journalist and an author. I've written several books about the, the myths, megaliths, and astronomy of the mostly of the Stone Age megalithic sites of the, uh, the Boyne Valley, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, and I've ventured outside this area from time to time. So tonight I'm going to concentrate on the oldest stuff, but I should probably tell you that the immediate Boyne Valley region, within, say, a 25-minute radius by car, we probably have the best examples of many different historical uh, uh, monuments and relics and landscapes. So we have the largest megalithic passage tombs in Ireland and some of the grandest in Europe. Uh, within a stone's throw we have what was once the largest Cistercian Abbey at Mellifont Abbey founded in 1142. A few miles up the road we have the monastic site of Monaster Boyce and probably the finest example of an Irish High Cross with Murdoch's Cross. Uh, about eight miles Upriver, we have the village of Slain, where St. Patrick was said to have introduced Christianity into Ireland. And then about five or six miles to the south of Slain, we have the Hill of Tara, which is where the High Kings reigned from in the Iron Age and in medieval times. And in Drogheda, which is my hometown, just a few minutes away, we have uh, a walled Norman city dating from the 12th century, and we have lots of impressive remains, including the head of a saint, St. Oliver Plunkett, that is kept in a glass casket in St. Peter's Parish Church. So if you're in Drogheda over the next few days and you fancy, fancy something quite gruesome, go and have a look at St. <laughs> Oliver Plunkett's head. So our journey starts uh, by venturing through the mists of time, all the way back to an era that begins about 6,000 years ago. And so the first arrivals into Ireland after the Ice Age, and the Ice Age is quite destructive in Ireland. The ice scours away all life and the floodwaters wash everything away. So we're told that approximately 10,000 years ago, Ireland was sterile, no human life here. The first people to arrive here arrived about 9,000 years ago. But then later than that, there comes this revolution, uh, a people arriving from mainland Europe who bring with them technology in the form of, well, basically farming. And farming, uh, agriculture changes the whole way of life from a hunter-gatherer existence where you spend the majority of your life trying to catch your food to a life where you can grow your grains and you keep cattle and you have what might be called a surplus. So the people who brought agriculture originated in uh, the Near East mainly, uh, I think, emanating from what we would call modern-day Turkey, and specifically Anatolia. So the three great monuments of Brunebonia are the one here with the white quartz facade, which you would know as Newgrange, but that is a name that was given to it by the Cistercians. The Cistercian order uh, established their monastery at um, Mellifont in 1142, uh, they came from Clairvaux in France. They were granted all of the lands all the way down to the Boyne, and they established several large farms, which were called granges. And, 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 and you just explain the Boyne is a river. Yeah. Um, uh, the Boyne River has its source in <coughs> County Kildare. In mythology, mythology says it has its source at Necton's Well, which is identified with an actual well called Trinity Well, which is in the grounds of Newbury House in Carberry in County Kildare. It is Ireland's second river in terms of uh, fame, only to the Shannon, but in terms of its mythical um, significance, it is uh, first and foremost. Um, the Boyne would have um, allowed all of the people arriving into Ireland in prehistory access to all of these wonderfully um, productive and fertile lands. Um, at the beginning uh, at the mouth of the Boyne, which is literally just a, what is it, is it a mile or two away from us here, 
a few kilometres away um, and then tracing its way down through the Boyne Valley landscape and onwards then down towards Kildare. So the Newgrange uh, was named by the Cistercians. The old name of Newgrange is in fact Sheed in Broga or Sheed Mach on Oak, which is something we can explain just in a little bit. Uh, west of Newgrange is the site of Nauth, which is sort of second in fame, but uh, principal in terms of size and complexity. Uh, the, the main cairn, the chambered cairn or passage tomb, which is the large mound, has two passageways facing roughly east and west, uh, which is one more than we know Newgrange has. It's bigger, it has 127 curb stones around it, and 16 of these smaller satellite mounds occupies a very prominent position on the steep northern bank uh, of the Boyne. And as you can see, the Boyne, the Boyne River is in the background with its floodplain there. And just to the top right of the image in the mist there uh, on, uh, is the Hill of Slane. And the third and least well-known of the great monuments is Douth. Uh, probably the reason for that is Douth hasn't been excavated in modern times. And has a sort of uh, an old worldly sort of covered over, um, tree covered, bramble covered look to it. Uh, and hasn't yet been uh, opened as it were, but not by modern archeologists anyway. So the Boyne landscape is very impressive in terms of its archeology. span In the 1990s, it was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which offers it uh, great protection. Um, Everything that's done there in terms of construction and planning work uh, within the bounds of the UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, is done very, very carefully and with strict supervision. Uh, I recently asked an archaeologist, uh, people had asked me, how many monuments are there contained in the loop of the Boyne, the bend, what we call the bend of the Boyne? My guess would have been about 100. Apparently, the total number of prehistoric monuments in the bend of the Boyne is 132, including this mound along the river uh, covered in the mist, which is what we might call one of the satellite mounds. So there are all of these sites that haven't been yet uh, investigated by archaeologists, which are assumed to be passage tombs. And we begin our journey with Newgrange, which occupies uh, primacy in terms of the mythology. So in myth, Newgrange is a very important place. And obviously, uh, in ancient times, it, it was, the, I suppose, the centrepiece of the three monuments. So it uh, was excavated in the 1960s and 1970s by Professor Michael J. O'Kelly from University College Cork. And a little bit of restoration was done because it was deemed to be unsafe. All of the stone that you see there on the monument is actually the original stone, with the exception of the, the grey stone either, immediately either side of the doorway, which was added to allow the steps, to allow visitors to access uh, the inner tomb. Um, you'll see the outer ring of stones around it. Uh, they were actually added later. They're a Bronze Age addition. Uh, what can I tell you about Newgrange in the mythology? In the myths, Newgrange is the place that was built and owned by the gods the gods of the old Irish myths, the Tua de Danann. And their chief uh, god, well, there are two threads of mythology. One that says their chief, the supreme deity, Dagda, is very much seen as a solar deity, uh, was the builder and the first occupier of Newgrange. And then a separate thread says that, in fact, one of the other Tua de Danann chiefs, a gentleman called Elkmar, was its first owner. So today, the modern visitor coming to Newgrange uh, has a wonderful access to the monument. On the right, you'll see the white quartz. Uh, this stone, according to geologists, was brought to Newgrange from County Wicklow, a distance by sea and river of about 80 to 90 kilometres. Uh, no mean achievement. Interspersed with that, are the rounded sort of cobblestones. These are granite and granodiorite stones from the Mourne Mountains, uh, fetched from Dundalk Bay about a distance of maybe 30 kilometres by sea and river. And then the very large stones, the curb stones, the, the belt of stones around the base of the monument, they are made of a type of shale called uh, grey wacky or green grit, which our geologists tell us was sourced from the village of Clotter Head, which is only uh, about five kilometres northeast of us here, uh, up on the coastline. It's a fishing village now. 
and uh, Clara Head is the place where uh, in, in very, very ancient prehistory, we're going back 400 million years, seismic events, the coming together of continents created rock formations that are vertical and the vertical shale formations at Clara Head made it easy to break away some of the big stones and the archaeologists tell us that they were brought strapped to the underneath of barges down along the sea and up the River Boyne. There are 97 curb stones at Newgrange and another 40 or 50 large stones in the passageway and the chamber, each requiring its own uh, um, expedition up and down uh, into the sea. Uh, so these were uh, an ingenious uh, people and a very capable people given the statistics we know about them. So the people who built these monuments were smaller than we are. The average height of a female was five foot two. The average height of a male was five foot seven. The average life expectancy, uh, the average age of death for a male was 28 and for a female was 26. Maximum life expectancy, 40. So at 44, if I was living in the Neolithic, I would be a grey old druid. <laughs> and so probably the most famous of the curb stones, as one of the guides at Newgrange says, this is the most photographed stone in the world after Mick Jagger. <laughs> this is the entrance curb stone with its famous triple spiral design. So one of the things about Newgrange compared to Nauth, and we look at that in some of the slides, is that, you know, there are 97 curb stones, but there are only three that are very, very uh, well decorated. Uh, and this is one of them, the main entrance curb stone. Uh, by the way... <coughs> The minimum weight for these stones is one ton, maximum weight 10 tons, average weight three tons, which I'm told is the weight of an Asian elephant. I've never tried to pick one up, but I believe they're quite heavy. And so this is the entrance of Newgrange. And so if I can uh, go mobile. Don't need to do anything. No, I don't. Excellent. So the, this grey stone on either side of the entrance, this was a modern addition. Uh, during the archaeology. Initially, to access the passage of Newgrange, you actually had to climb over the entrance stone. And because there are 250,000 people visit Newgrange every year, it wasn't practical and they would have destroyed the stone. So the Office of Public Works put in these steps and slightly set back this area. Uh, this is the so called roof box. This is a very important aperture in the design of Newgrange. And also interesting is the placement of this stone beside the door, the door stone, which may have been used to close off the site uh, when there weren't burials taking place. Curbstone 52 at the rear of the monument and you will see uh, incised upon this stone uh, various um, artistic features and designs and patterns. A lot of the megalithic art is geometric. You see spirals and circles and uh, lozenges, triangles, chevrons, cup holes, uh, arcs, and all sorts of other things. Um, we don't yet have a thoroughly convincing explanation for what they mean, but uh, a lot of the interpretations tend to focus on cosmological, astronomical, spiritual aspects. And the third of the sort of highly decorated stones is Curbstone 62. And it has been suggested well, the spiral is ubiquitous across the world in ancient cultures. It can be found everywhere from America and South America to um, the Far East and even into the Pacific in different places. Um, some scholars have suggested that this is a very good symbol representing the movement of the sun from summer solstice to winter solstice and back again. Because if you try to trace the sun's movement, you know it forms an arc in the sky every day. And as it's growing from winter towards summer, that arc gets bigger and bigger. And if you wanted to represent that in one single symbol, you would use this continuous spiral, the winding down of the sun from summer towards winter and the winding back up again from winter towards summer. And so the most famous aspect of Newgrange today, Sheed and Broga. Sheed is an old Irish word which is commonly translated as a fairy mound, but the fairies are a Victorian uh, rival. They are uh, 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 the little people, the good folk, as they're called in Ireland, the Dinamá. And 
So they are cons- assumed by some of the scholars to be the diminished gods, but uh, the word she to me represents something powerful, as in access, a portal to other realms, including the heavenly realms. At two minutes to nine, on the shortest day of the year, on the winter solstice, uh, standing at the entrance of Newgrange, you can just see the sun begin to appear over the horizon of a hill that is called Red Mountain. And I think that Red Mountain is a very ancient name, and it's so, so-called because the sky gets red in the winter mornings before the sunrise. And so this is what it looks like when you're standing there on the shortest days of the year. Uh, fabulously atmospheric, except for when it's cloudy and rainy, and then it's not quite so much fun. That, by the way, doesn't stop at least a thousand people from turning up on the official day of winter solstice every year. And rain, hail, shine, snow, ice, doesn't matter. They all have great fun. And so what happens is the aforementioned roof box is this opening above the doorway, this little magical slit that lets light in. So light comes in the doorway, but a separate beam of light comes in through the roof box. And so when you're in the passageway, this is what it looks like. So you can probably see there that the the light that comes in the doorway is separate to the light that comes in from the roof box. This is a very, very clever design on the part of the builders. And so I'm lucky. uh, I've spent the past 19 years uh, studying and photographing and writing about these monuments. And I'm very fortunate to have had access, uh, which is... uh, not exclusive, but it's difficult um, because these photographs are all taken when there are uh, people who've won the winter solstice lottery huddled in the chamber watching the events. And I've got my camera set up here uh, just to maybe uh, to give a little different view of what happens. So this is just immediately inside the entrance looking towards the chamber and you can see the separate the separate light beams. So uh, this is a, a 3D model of Newgrange uh, done by an artist called Sean Doran. And what I wanted to show you here was, this is the full path of the sunlight on winter solstice from the entrance all the way down through the passageway into the chamber. This is the chamber here, all the way into the end recess. So the chamber is cruciform. There are three recesses, it's cross-shaped. And one of the reasons for showing you this is that this is not like the pyramids. They did not cut the stone into you know, with straight faces that didn't straighten stones. They used the stones organically. Now, some of them have what's called pick dressing, which is a sort of a surface dressing on them. But the stones are placed in such a way as to create this bend, and the bend, the the double bend, narrows the beam such that it is only 17 centimetres wide when it enters into the chamber. And so this must have been a very powerful and magical event for the people of the time, because this place is in darkness, throughout the year until about a week before winter solstice and a week afterwards when the sunlight every day is coming down into the passageway and then for about maybe a week or ten days this golden sword of light uh, travels along the floor into the chamber. Now what the purpose of this was is something that we we, we could discuss for many an hour and have great uh, uh, discussions about. However, it's clear that on the one hand, there's a spiritual dimension. The people, maybe they definitely buried their dead, the remains of their deceased in basins in the, in the chambers of these places. Those remains were fragmented post uh, cremation. Uh, they were very small bone fragments. 1,200 bone fragments were recovered during the excavations of Newgrange by Professor O'Kelly. And from those 1,200 fragments, all they could tell, all they could surmise was at least five individuals were represented. Um, So maybe they saw the the light as bringing the souls out into the other world, uh, you know, at the solstice. But the other thing is it performs a very important calendar function because you can hook uh, the year on the solstices. And this is a view from the passageway again, looking out towards the roof box and the upper uh, beam of light is the one that reaches the chamber. And it's very clever because New Grange is built on a ridge on a sloping hill. So when you walk in the entranceway, the roof box is two meters, it's above your head. But by the time you get to the chamber, you're actually at the level that the roof box was at the entrance. You've actually walked uphill as you've walked towards the chamber. So they use the natural slope of the hill 
to make this happen. And when you're in the chamber, as I have been lucky to be, um, the effect is very dramatic. Quite a lot of people have very moving experiences uh, in Newgrange at the solstice. There's a, an exceptional spiritual dimension to it. Um, I've written about this in one of my books. I, I wrote a chapter. I petitioned people from around the world who'd been to Newgrange, and I asked them if they wouldn't mind sharing their experiences. Quite a few people have what they would describe as life-changing uh, experiences at the solstice in Newgrange. It really is, it's solemn in a way and celebratory in another. Um, people find they're emotionally very moved at the sight of the light coming in and they find themselves afterwards somehow altered by the experience. We shouldn't be at all surprised at that given the mythology. The mythology is fascinating. So there are, there's a trinity associated with New Grange, a trinity of gods, Dagda, and Boin, Boin is she who gives her name to the Boin River, the River Boin, Bofin, the white cow goddess. And uh, they produce the miraculous offspring who is Angus Og, hence the other name for Newgrange, Bru Mac on Og, the brew of the young son, Angus. And the story about how Angus came into being was that in this separate thread of mythology where Elkmar is the owner of Newgrange, Dagda, uh, Elkmar's wife is Bowen. Dagda, the chief of the gods, he has a desire for Bowen. And in order to lie with Bowen, he casts a spell on Elkmar. He makes him go on an errand. And in Elkmar's mind, he thinks he's only away for one day, but in fact, he's away for nine months. And in his absence, Dagda and Bowen conceive uh, the child Angus Old, and he is born. And he is called, according to the Dinchenicus, which is a, a medieval document containing lots of the ancient place name stories of Ireland, which are ironically recorded by Christian monks. The Christian monks of medieval times are responsible for recording a lot of pagan, pre-Christian mythology. Uh, the, the reason for Angus being called Angus Oak, the young son, is because his mother says, Young is the son who was conceived at the beginning of the day and born between that and the evening time. In other words, he was conceived and born in the same day because of the spell that Dagda had cast upon Elkmar. But the myth is even more specific. The myth describes the event in, color, in poetic language, in metaphorical terms, because it says that Dagda entered the house of Elkmar House of Elkmar being Newgrange, the brew of Elkmar. And he did this at a time when the sun was standing still in the heavens. And that is the solstice, because at the solstice, the sun's rising position is standing still on the horizon, hence the word solstice, which means standing still sun, or in Irish, Greenstad, which means stopped sun. So uh, Dagda comes into the house of Elkmar and uh, impregnates Bo Boeing and the miraculous child Angus Og is born. But later what happens is Angus comes along when he's a little bit grown up and he says to his daddy, he says, Dad, I'd love to have Newgrange for a night and a day. Would you give that to me, would you? And Dagda, being the loving, caring father that he was, said, no problem at all, son, you can have the brew for a night and a day. And the next day he arrives back and he says, now I'll have my house back. And Angus says to him, all of time is made up, all of time is made up of nights and days. Thus you have granted me Brunabonia for eternity. And Dagda is forced to acquiesce to his son's wit. The story there, in its simplest form, is that the sun of the old year is seen to be losing power to the sun of the new year. The old sun giving way to the new sun, which is precisely what happens at winter solstice. The whole hopes of the community who built these monuments is pinned upon the return of the sun and the growing of the crops and the fertility of the land and that surplus of food which has allowed them to build the monuments in the first place. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the reasons photography is banned in the chamber of Newgrange uh, so if you go to Newgrange at any time, uh, the tour groups are brought inside. 
but you're told beforehand you cannot take photographs. And one of the reasons is it's extremely distracting. And so as you can see, uh, winter solstice 2010, I'm trying to get a lovely picture of the sun coming in and somebody else has their phone on and they're trying to get a picture. So that's what happens. And that's what it looks like in there. Um, despite the vastness of the monument, the central chamber is only big enough to comfortably hold, comfortably, about 15 people. And by the time your group gets to 25, people are squashed against each other and say, oh, sorry, excuse me. And uh, any more than that is just not practical. Also, Newgrange acts, in my work, I have highlighted the fact that Newgrange acts as an aperture for some other objects, including the dog star Sirius at the time it was built. And there was a, an old folk tale recorded by Joseph Campbell in the 19... Well, he wrote about it in the 1950s, before the excavation and restoration, before it could ever have been witnessed in modern times. There was a, no, a local tale that said, the light of the morning star shines into the chamber of Newgrange on one morning at dawn, on the winter solstice, on one morning in eight years. And actually, astronomically, this is perfectly true because Venus follows a cycle over eight years during which it appears sometimes as the evening star, sometimes as the morning star. And there is one uh, year out of every eight where Venus appears in the pre-dawn sky, can be seen by a, uh, an observer prostra um, prostrate on the chamber floor, and then later the same morning, the winter solstice sun also shines into the chamber. And further to all that is the fact that at certain times in its meanderings and wanderings through the sky, the light of the moon would also be visible from inside the chamber of Newgrange. And so uh, that's the most famous of the three, uh, rediscovered in 1699, um, because at that time all of the cairn material had slipped down, covering all the curbstones and all the entrance, and it just looked like a grass-covered hill. And uh, the new landowner in 1699, after the Battle of the Boyne, uh, was uh, Charles Campbell, and he ordered his labourers to, to take stone from this cairn to build his house. And as luck would have it, they just started taking stone from immediately outside the entrance and shortly afterwards discovered the entrance and the passage into Newgrange, something that archaeologists tell us hadn't been seen for 4,000 years. And yet the local mythology uh, in uh, the pre-excavation days, the local folklore was that the sun shone, shines into Newgrange uh, on the winter solstice. And this couldn't have been seen in modern times because of the slow collapse of the cairn and the leaning of the stones inside the light had been cut off. And so in 1962, Professor O'Kelly began his excavations. In 1967, he had gone home to County Cork for Christmas. But it was nagging him because they had done the restoration of the roof box and the passageway stones. And it was nagging him, it was on his mind that the local people had told him about this phenomenon. So he drove all the way up to the Boyne Valley on December the 21st, 1967, and became the first human being in the modern era to witness the sunlight shining into Newgrange, precisely as predicted by the locals who had apparently retained this knowledge over 4,000 years. And so then we head over to Nowth. Nowth uh, was excavated beginning again in the late 60s and for a period of almost 40 years by Professor George Ogan. And well, while Newgrange retained uh, lots of secrets, Nowth retained even more. And during the course of those excavations, a huge amount of uh, information was revealed. As I said before, two passageways, a bigger cairn, um, with all of these satellites around it and all sorts of different monuments, including on the top of it what was the foundations of a Norman fortification, because in early Norman times, now the mound was actually fortified and used. Uh, it was the capital city of the kingdom of North Brega. But certainly in Neolithic times, it was very, a very exciting place. There are 127 curb stones, so uh, 28 more than are at Newgrange. Um, and uh, the, entrance, the entrance ways are very interesting because in contrast to Newgrange, at Newgrange the, uh, the quartz was, was found at the bottom of the current slip material, all the material that had slipped off Newgrange. The quartz was at the bottom and Professor O'Kelly assumed 
uh, one of the Carrigan's uh, experiments that showed the stones would have been on the front. However, at now the story is different. Uh, the archaeologist believes that the quartz and the granite cobbles that are interspersed, which is the same type of stone you find in Range, were all set on the ground as some sort of a sacred setting outside the entrances. And each of the entrances has this large pillar or gnomon. Uh, in this case, this one is a, a sandstone pillar. And at the eastern entrance, a smaller stone, again, uh, uh, just immediately outside the entrance. And again, the same idea, these quartz settings and a sort of a very large stone basin that has been speculated might have watered it for some sort of ceremonial purposes. The bridge obviously is modern to take visitors into a little room uh, just to show them uh, the Iron Age ditch because in Iron Age times there was a huge ditch built in behind the curbstones to fortify the mound. So now it saw a lot of changes during its lifetime whereas Newgrange didn't see as many. Um, so at roughly speaking at the time of the equinoxes the sun shines into the passageways of Nauth. Sadly, in modern times, the sun doesn't shine into the eastern passage of Nauth because of the modern construction there. And in addition to that, immediately behind that are some early Christian souterrains. Souterrains are these dry stone tunnels that were built as food storage places and also would have served as nice little hiding places from the Vikings. And the Vikings started their shenanigans in this area in the 9th century. Uh, they had a, um, uh, an, an establishment, a long fort, along the coast of County Loud here, of only about maybe 10 or 15 kilometres from us, at a place called Anagasen, Lynn Dukel, the Viking uh, long, long fort uh, along the coast, and would have made successive raids, one of which is mentioned in the mythology uh, as taking place in the 9th century. So on the, in, on the western side of Nauth, uh, in around about this time, from this time leading into early October, the sun, the setting sun, shines into the passage of Nauth there. And so um, you won't see many pictures of this because this is not publicised in the same way as the alignment that Newgrange is publicised. So this is much rarer. Um, these pictures were taken about five or six years ago, uh, I think on the 3rd or 4th of October, uh, and just show the way the sunlight shines down the long passageway uh, at Nauth's western passage. That is a view of the eastern passage, as a, the, obviously the lighting is modern. <laughs> Um, so you can see the way it's been, um, well basically when the archaeologists came to these places in the 60s, you know because of the subsidence a lot of the passage orthostats were leaning inwards and some of the roofing stones were sort of squashed down. So in the case of Newgrange and in the case of here at Mount, um, the archaeologists removed the capping stones right into the orthostats and then put everything back uh, to make it safe. Uh, more than anything. Uh, now it's not practical to enter the eastern chamber of Nauth, even though it's longer uh, than Newgrange and has a cruciform chamber. Uh, the reason for that is because in the last few metres uh, the stones lean in so so much that you have to crawl on your belly to enter the chamber of Nauth. That's, uh, that's no fun, I can tell you, I've done it. And if you can emerge without being covered in muck from head to toe, you'd be doing very well. So the visitor to Nauth is struck by, as I say, the complexity of the site. And there is so much to see and so many eras that are represented. Apparently 10 different phases of activity at Nauth. And the first of those, by the way, is pre, pre the, the, the mound building. Uh, the remains of a Neolithic house which was found underneath, which dates back to about 6,000 years and this is a view from the top of the main mound, looking at some of the satellite uh, mounds and off into the distance uh, along the Boyne Valley, uh, just approaching winter time. Now it is open to the public from Easter through until Halloween, uh, so it will be closing to the public in about a month or five weeks. Uh, one of the things that really strikes you about Nauth is the plethora of megalithic art in comparison to at Newgrange. So there are three heavily decorated stones out of 97 at Newgrange. At Nauth, out of 127 curbstones, 90 are very well decorated. This is uh, an oft-quoted statistic that Nauth contains uh, over a quarter of all of the megalithic art in Western Europe. And you might ask why Western Europe is important. Well, that is where these uh, megalithic uh, tombs and these large megalithic sites are concentrated. So in the Iberian Peninsula in France, in Britain, Ireland, Orkney, and up into Scandinavia. So this is curbstone five, 
with a, a, one of these huge spirals and other symbols on it. And to be honest, you can make your own interpretation. You're not right and you're not wrong. This isn't a language. Um, this is likely to have, you know, this symbolism, uh, which may have been representational in some cases, especially pertaining to the astronomy. Um, there's a subjective nature to um, megalithic art and everybody who goes to Newgrange and Nouth to look at the art comes away with their own impression of what it means, which has led some scholars to suggest that the monuments reflect back at you what you bring to them. Um, so, you know, say what you see and make your own mind up. The impressive thing is that they've survived, probably because they've been buried uh, shale and muddy sandstone is, a, is an easy stone to work in comparison with the likes of granite. The difficulty with it is it gets weathered much easier. So the stones during winter time are covered over with a large tarpaulin to keep the frost away from them because the frost gets into the, into the stones uh, and you know, causes cracks to appear and parts of the stone to flake off. Everybody, nearly everybody who sees carvings like this think that's a sundial. Uh, again, that's make your own mind up. And some scholars have said that this is a sundial. Uh, however, if you see its position and you try to put a stick or a gnome on in the cup hole, uh, it's not going to work a lot of the time because of the position of the stone. However, it's fascinating nonetheless. Uh, what, we, what the archaeologists call, or the megalithic art experts call, inverted seas. Uh, I've written about this stone, that this is... This is, this is like the cosmology of the Boyne Valley, heaven's mirror. What is happening in the sky is reflected on the ground. And this one, uh, there's a very convincing explanation of this so-called calendar stone uh, at Nouth. Uh, so there are 20, 22 inverted seas, or let's call them crescents, across the middle of the stone. And then these come up here and arc out until they form seven circles across the top of the stone. In the middle of the stone there's this waved uh, feature, this snake running through the stone, and then uh, here, lower central, and obliterating three of the crescents is this large spiral. The explanation for this is 22 crescents and seven rounds makes 29, which is the number of approximately the number of days in a synodic uh, period of the moon. The time it takes the moon to go from full moon back to full moon, or say first crescent back to first crescent again. And there are three days of the lunar month where the moon is invisible because it's obscured, because it's in the same part of the sky as the sun. And the total count of this line is 31, and if you go back, it's again 62, which is the number of synodic periods in five solar years. Is it a case that they were trying to make calculations, trying to reconcile the lunar and the solar years, which are distinctly out of sync with each other? Because if you watch 12 full moons, that is equal to 354 days, which is 11 days short of a solar year. So what it means is every few years you have to add an extra full moon. You need to count in 12s and 13s. Uh, and they never even out until you get to 19 years, exactly 19 years. 19 solar years is exactly equal to 254 sidereal lunar periods. In other words, the time it takes the moon to go from, say, Orion back to Orion again and 235 synodic months, full moon to full moon. So I won't bore you with the astronomy because I know it's complex, but needless to say that uh, one of the things that's been pointed out is the 127 curb stones is half the number of lunar sidereal months in a 19 year metonic cycle. In other words, if you counted the curb stones of Nelith twice, 254, that's the number of sidereal lunar months in a 19-year synodic period of the moon. And that's when everything resynchronizes. And again, more of these uh, somewhat inexplicable patterns and the intricacy with which they are carved and the immaculate nature of, of their preservation in some cases, which is quite extraordinary. This is a replica of the large basin stone in the eastern chamber of uh, Nauth with uh, a replica of the bone fragments that might have been placed there. These basin stones are so large that they have to have been in situ before the, uh, the chambers are built around them. They cannot have been dragged up through the passageway because they're too big. So these are of fundamental importance. These are the first things that are set down when the monuments are being built.
This stone is the first thing. You put it there and everything else gets built around it. Quite extraordinary. And you might have been wondering earlier in the aerial image what this, uh, this is. This is uh, what the archaeologists refer to as a grooved wear timber circle. So they found post holes in the ground uh, which had this particular type of late Neolithic pottery in them called grooved wear. Uh, we've no uh, adequate explanation as to what these might be, but they're also called four posters, not because they're a bed, but because in the inner part of them there are generally four posts. And one of the lines of speculation by archaeologists is that those posts held uh, some sort of a platform which may have been used for excarnation rituals, what we might call sky burial. In other words, placing the corpse out in the open air and letting the birds strip the flesh from it before the um, cremation and burial ceremonies took place. So that's now, and that's the timber circle here in the foreground. And there are lots and lots of features at Mouth that make it such a worthwhile and beautiful place to visit. The last of the three great monuments, I'm just going to check my time, uh, is Doubt. Doubt wasn't excavated in modern times, but unfortunately was subject to a disastrous excavation in the 1840s at the time of the Great Famine by R.H. Firth and his colleagues. Uh, from the Royal, Royal Irish Academy. At a time when the local people were starving and had no food, these uh, uh, well-to-do gentlemen raised a special subscription uh, to excavate the monument. They weren't looking for bones and they weren't looking to find out the date of doubt. This is uh, archaeology in its old-fashioned um, treasure hunting mode because in 1842, uh, a labourer digging at Newgrange had found a substantial collection of gold items, which is called the Coiningham find, and that is in the British Museum. And I think that's what led Firth and his colleagues to excavate Delft. So what they basically did was they start, started from the top, taking all the stones out and did, working their way down, leaving this huge crater. And after two seasons, two summers of work, they didn't find anything of significance and they just left the place in disarray, unfortunately. We're lucky they stopped when they did because they might have destroyed it completely. Now, Douth has two passageways that we know of and they're both on the western side. Uh, one is called Douth North and one is called Douth South. And that's not because they face north and south. It's just because one is more northerly and one is more southerly. Um, and so it's a beautiful place to spend time because you know you don't have the guides and the buses and the tour groups and nobody. And quite often when you go there, you're there on your own. It's a lovely place to spend time and to reflect. Also, as you can see, to take photographs like that midwinter shot, and even at night time, you know, under the stars, to maybe do what the ancient uh, builders might have done to watch the stars and to talk about uh, the stories that inspired them. Uh, etc etc the great sycamore tree that grows out of doubt <coughs> was probably added there by viscount netterville in the early part of the 19th century uh, it's considered now to be part of the monument i'd hate to see it go new newgrange had trees growing out of it when professor o'kelly started his excavations there in 1962 the southern of the chambers at doubt it's a short passageway in a circular chamber uh, allows the light of the sun in throughout the whole winter period, really from uh, what we would call Samhain, which is the old festival marking the beginning of winter, or modern day Halloween, through winter solstice and all the way through to early February, through to the beginning of spring at uh, Inbulk. And this is a picture showing the sunlight entering the passage there. So if you uh, are in Ireland and you have entered the lottery to get into Newgrange on the morning of winter solstice and you haven't had your name drawn out, don't be disappointed. Go over to Douth on the afternoon of December 21st and it's open to the public for two hours from 2pm to 4pm. And if you're lucky, like I was last December, you might actually even see the sun shining in there uh, in the evening time. And so you can see the other folks huddled around there uh, trying to get a view of it, uh, the sun shining in and shining on that stone at the rear of the circular chamber. <coughs> Fun and games. Ten, they allow about 10 people in at a time. And what happened was it was totally grey last winter solstice, raining in the morning, totally grey, overcast at Newgrange, no sun, 
and totally grey at two o'clock in the afternoon, but at about three o'clock for two minutes, the sun found a gap in the clouds and entered in, and then it closed up again, and that was the end of it. So we were really enthralled, and that's the entrance. And so, as you can see, uh, one excavated. So this is the top of the curb stones. Uh, there are several feet, feet of, of, of stone there yet to be revealed. A stone on its eastern side is generally commonly referred to as the stone of the seven stones. So you might see the seven, just in case you can't see them. I will point them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The stone of the seven stones. And if you get it during the daylight at a particular time when the sun is at an oblique angle, angle to it, you can see the arch very well. And in the, actually, this is taken at winter solstice. On the morning of the solstice, the sun rises at the perfect angle to light these suns up. Um, not sure whether that's intentional, but it's certainly very dramatic. And this is a stone uh, very nearby, which has these large uh, circles carved into it. So Delft is, is the only site that, that as I say, largely holds on to its secrets, for now anyway. The story of Delft is that it was built on the command of the King of Ireland at the time, whose name was Bressel Bodibad. And that second name, Bodibad, apparently means lacking in cattle. Because what happened was, during his reign, there was a cattle famine, a disease on the cattle of Ireland, until there was only a bull and seven cows left. And he commanded all the men of Ireland to come here to this place and to build him, according to the Dinshenicus, this collection of place name stories, to build him a tower from which he could reach heaven, alike to the Tower of Nimrod. And you can see the Christian scribe incursions into that myth. I'm sorry that it doesn't mention the women. That's not my uh, fault. It's just that the myth says all the men. It doesn't mention the women. Anyway, uh, in order for the work to take place, the men say, we, we want to... We want to only have daylight for this task. And so the king's sister uh, casts a spell on the sun. And she makes the sun stand still in the sky and they have endless day. And what happens is the king and his sister fall in love with each other and they commit incest. And when that happens, the spell is broken and a sudden darkness comes upon the place. <clears throat> and the men say, we were promised daylight for this task. And because day has gone and night has come, we are abandoning this place. And forevermore it shall be known as Duad. And that's the Irish name from which doubt is anglicised. And that means darkness, the place of darkness. Very close by uh, to doubt, only maybe a kilometre, less than a kilometre away, is the Great Doubt Henge, uh, which is the second largest embanked enclosure in Ireland and a very dramatic site where there are two entrance ways into the Henge, one of the southwest and one of the northeast, uh, which myself and Richard Moore speculated were aligned on summer solstice sunrise and became the first people, I believe, to photograph it in the modern era. This photograph was taken last year on summer solstice, so you can see you know, the alignment towards the place where the sun rises on the longest day of the year, and that may account for the endless day of the story of doubt, because if... If you wanted endless day to build something, summer solstice in Ireland is the perfect time to do it because there's, there's no full darkness at night in the middle of summer in Ireland. You get this endless twilight and enough light to do uh, tasks. And just to finish up, <coughs> to mention uh, this wonderful field here, which is on Newgrange Farm, very close to the Newgrange Monument, where this summer, I mean, you could fly over this field every day for 20 years and never see anything. And yet this summer, some extreme magic happened. This, this here is uh, one of these henges, or these embanked henges. And the Boyne has several of these. Uh, and this field doesn't appear to have anything in it. And so this summer, during the drought, have a look at that circular shape there. During the drought, I was encouraged to fly down to have a look at that by an archaeologist. He said, because of the drought, you might see features that you don't see any other time. And indeed, he was right. This is, um, uh, it's called Site Q, um, uh, I've, in a way that I've never seen it before. And all these features showed up. But while I was flying around it, <coughs> on... The evening of Tuesday, the 10th of July, at 8.47pm, I discovered this in the next field. And this is a previously unknown monument. Um, now, what we're looking at here are archaeological features that are several feet beneath the surface of the ground. Uh, probably double segmented ditch sections, so this is where they dug out these trenches. And then, 
at two concentric rings of dots which are likely to have supported posts. So in essence, this is very like site P because it also has an extra sort of crescent-shaped annex on its site, like site P has, except for this wasn't in bank. They didn't build up a bank on this one. This would like to have been what might, you might call a timber hinge or a palisaded enclosure. And you can see how close it is to the river. Uh, these sites generally date to the late Neolithic. So well, I've been told maybe 2900 BC, which is about two centuries after the construction of Newgrange. What they were for is open to uh, debate and speculation. Obviously, the, the hinges are ceremonial in nature. They're to do with large gatherings of people. And, you know, in, in total contrast to the passage tombs, which are obviously designed for intimate, sacred ceremonies involving only a few, select few members of the community, the hinge sites are, we think, much more to do with communal gatherings. And perhaps... Uh, I've speculated myself as places where arriving populations came for seasonal festivities. People who didn't live in the Boyne Valley because so monumental is the scale of the valley. So much human labour is required to build all of these monuments in this few centuries that I don't think it's possible a, a local population uh, could have done this. I think this is a project involving regional input of labour, if not uh, further afield. In other words, people perhaps coming into the Boyne Valley for seasonal festivities from in maybe parts of Britain, maybe Orkney, uh, maybe even from France, uh, who knows. And so I've investigated the alignment of it and I think it might have been used to look at the sunsets at the beginning of summer and at the end of summer, which would tally with the idea of a seasonal feast involving the fruits of the harvest of the, the, you know, the growth period that's bracketed by this. The sun is moving towards summer solstice and stops and it comes back again and it aligns with the hinge twice, once on the way up at the beginning of summer and once at the way down, at the, on the way down. <clears throat> this is a plan of the monument from what can be seen in the photographs. Uh, I completed this actually only last night. And what it does, very interestingly, is shows you that the monument is not circular. People, people look at it and they think it's perfectly circular. It's not actually circular. It's, you can see it's almost like two joined semicircles that have had a small amount of cut off them. And the reason I think the features are harder to see on the north side is because it's just to do with the slope of the field. This side of the field is maybe a metre or two higher than this side. So this side was retaining the water. The archaeological features were retaining the water a bit more. <clears throat> and here's another one here. Site so LP2, this was discovered in 2010. There are actually three hinges in a row. Three in a row along the river. This is a very spectacular landscape. And as a result of the summer's discoveries, we can now say that the Bend of the Boyne has the highest concentration of hinge monuments anywhere in the world. <clears throat> And these are two, uh, a little bit to the east of the new discoveries. These are uh, two more that have been discovered uh, recently. So there are a total, I think, of seven or eight uh, making it a, a monumental landscape. And you can see just how close the whole thing is to Newgrange, 750 metres from the centre of Newgrange to the centre of the Henge, less than a kilometre. A truly monumental landscape. And as I say, created by a people who were ingenious and who lived short and harsh lives, uh, but who came together, whether that was by enforced labour or willing, willingness to participate, and maybe a, a combination of those things. Uh, the fact that the Douth myth suggests that the king brought all the men of Ireland, did he bring them there against their will? Did he make them do it? Or <clears throat> is it a possibility that he brought them there and, as the myth implies, that he paid them in food for the work because there was a cattle famine, there might have been a food shortage. And if you were arriving into the Boyne Valley and you were told, there's going to be food, but you're going to have to work for it, maybe you wouldn't have minded so much. These mottled features are very interesting. All we can do at this moment is speculate about these features. It's possible that these are hearts. And if these are hearts, these would be the first indication of community gathering 
uh, in Brunegonia. In other words, where people actually lived and cooked their food rather than where they held their ceremonies. Because up until this year, we have no evidence of where the community actually might have lived. And this is the first tantalising possible, possible evidence of that. And in the top northeast corner of the field, another of these four poster sites, a groove where timber circle, uh, and in addition to that, a very wide arc. Uh, there's actually two of them there, one of them is a bit harder to see when you're close up to it, which may be part of some sort of a palisaded avenue. These things all have the archaeological community very excited. This year has been very interesting weather-wise. It's the first time we've had a drought uh, of this magnitude since 1976. And droughts, despite the dis, uh, disadvantage to the agricultural community, uh, are the sort of things that get archaeologists very excited. <coughs> Following the publicity around the discovery of the new henge, um, uh, another 66 reports of sites uh, were, were lodged this year with the National Monument Service. Um, a, a friend of mine discovered a cluster of uh, 12 sites uh, near Dundalk, and my co-discoverer, Ken Williams, uh, made several other discoveries in the Boyne Valley, at the Hill of Tara, and in other places. So, uh, like the rainbow, uh, it's almost like a double-edged sword. You know, we had such a lack of rain for so long, and it caused difficulties for farming, but it was a great boon for the um, archaeological community. And so, we leave with just uh, a few images of Sheed and Broga, Newgrange, um, and I'm just the sort of person who spends a lot of time at these places in the evening time. And so it's lovely there in the evening time, because the buses are gone, all the tourists have gone, all the staff have gone home, and the road outside Newgrange is not a busy road, and you can spend lots of time there reflecting on it and all that. This uh, feature here, this U-shape in the field, is referred to as a cursus, which may have been some sort of ceremonial avenue or walkway. And this year, another cursus monument, uh, uh, basically over here by a few hundred metres, was excavated by Geraldine and Matthew Stout, local archaeologists, and found to be Neolithic in date. And as the sun swings around towards the winter, that's when it comes into alignment with New Grange. It might be immediately obvious uh, from this image, but New Grange is actually heart shaped. And again, that mound along the water. In the mythology, that mound is referred to as the Dog Does Mound, and this is apparently where he went to after Angus threw him out of his new range. Can I have it for a night and a day? Uh, and in the winter time, especially, I find that the colours are at their most remarkable. If you're interested in finding out more, uh, my website is mythicalireland.com and uh, if you're interested, I have copies of my book here, but if you're looking for a signed copy of my book at some stage, if you just go into the gallery and shop, you can find one in there. So if you want more information online, mythicalireland.com. Thanks very much. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you.